back for all the applicants. Um, Dr. Palladino? Yeah, hi all, my name is Leonidas. My last name is Paleodimos. I was born and raised um, in Greece. I came to the United States in 2015 to Jacobi. Um, I graduated in 2018. Then I spent two years in another hospital, and last year I came back because of the sense of belonging that Adars mentioned before. Uh, I have been blessed to be trained at Jacobi, and um, I'm very happy that I have been back for the past one year. Wonderful, folks. I, I'm sorry to interrupt. I, I, you know, it's, I find it very ironic. Uh, for those of you who have not met me, my name is Ravi. Um, I'm one of the co-founders of the Clinical Problem Solvers, and I live in San Francisco, California, the capital of tech, and yet I'm the only one, I think, with internet problems right now. But I think, um, I think they're corrected. And I, I actually did catch a glimpse of everybody's inter, uh, introductions, and I guess I'll, I'll try to rise to... Uh, thrown at me. But I, um, I wanted to thank you, um, uh, everyone, all five of you from Jacoby Medical Center for coming today. And I think what I did catch uh, is made it clear that this is the merge and marriage of two families today. The CP Solvers VMR community has been a family for um, just over two, um, yeah, throughout the pandemic, almost a year and a half or so. And then hearing your sense of community is, uh, is absolutely marvelous. I also see that there's a lot of people who haven't been part of VMR who are joining in large part because of uh, the sense that they get from your program. And maybe maybe we can go around just before we, um, uh, before we jump into the case to hear from each of you what your favorite memory, now that you're all done your training there, you finished it, all five of you. Can you share your favorite memory of, of training? Um, what comes to mind, even maybe in the cafeteria, maybe with a patient, but what's your favorite memory of, of your time in training? Favorite time in training. Okay, there's quite a few that stand out, and I'm trying to trying to make it. Um, okay, so I think I think one of the best things about being here is, like others said, it's a community feel. Everyone has your back. Everyone understands that you know you've come from a completely different place and how difficult it is to all of a sudden be a resident and you know try to have some professional identity. So I think my favorite, um, it's gonna sound a little morbid, bear with me on this, but one of my favorite memories is uh, from early intern year when I was at a code and uh, just who I was as a person at the time, I just wanted to kind of blend in with the walls, didn't wanna be seen, I didn't wanna be a part of it, I just, just wanted to be in the back. And then one of the one of the senior residents who was there kind of came up and he's like, hey, you know this patient? And I was like, yeah, he's like, say what you're thinking. It's okay. It can only help us if you say what you're thinking. So just kind of like stood just a little voice over my shoulder telling me to talk. And I think that was like the first, um, what do you say, the first attempt at confidence that I had here at Jacoby. And I was very early in intern year. And now like I'm, I'm so pleasantly surprised. I'm one of the chief residents. I'm doing this amazing thing with you guys. It's just, it's amazing. That is good. That is quite the story. Wow, that is quite the story. Thank you so much for sharing it. Christian, what, what is your favorite memory? Oh, yes, I think it's difficult to pick just one, but I would say uh, I, I also remember uh, having been in touch with so many patients, with so many families, with so many stories that you can hear. Like we are really, as Cesar said, we are really privileged to be able to serve this, uh, this population that has so many disadvantages. So, I remember once that I was with a, a very uh, sick, very sick patient that sadly was not much that we can do. So I remember the only thing that we did is just sit with the family in the, in the conference and we were just discussing and they were telling us histories about what, how was the patient before being sick. So at the end, everyone was really crying and sad, but at the same time, they were happy and relieved that we we're trying to do our best. So I, I really, that moment touched me, and uh, I would like to hopefully my family, if I have the case, being treated the same. And and I hope I think the family, even though it was a very difficult moment, they they had this this uh, this moment that they were able to say goodbye with a lot of respect. So I, I think one was my my favorite moments in my residency. Well, yeah, I think you're giving us insight into both you and how incredible you are and also the people around you. Thank you. Anyone else want to share a memory that they had? Um, yes, I, I think that one of the most important thing I found here, it's, uh, it's mentorship. 
it's mentorship as in my professional career, but also clinical mentorship. And I remember I was struggling with one patient um, about a, post, a diagnosis of cellulitis that's rapidly progressing. And I was really concerned for necrotizing fasciitis. fasciitis. Um, and I described the case to my mentor and she was like, do you want to see the patient together? And she was doing other things and seeing other patients. Like she did not hesitate one second to come with me to the bedside and re-examine the patient with me. And then she told me, this is not neck fasci. This is group A, lymphangitis. Mm. With total certainty. And she told me, start clindamycin, she's going to improve by tomorrow. We started, and like if it would be something riddled in a sacred lab, in a sacred book, on the <laughs> next day, the blood culture came back positive for GAS and uh. the patient improved. And like, it's not only the, 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 the way that how smart she was to make that diagnosis just with a physical exam, but also that she did not hesitate one second to come with me and re examine the patient. So I think that these little things has switched my career and my, my aspiration as a professional um, dramatically. Amazing. You know, it's hard not to reflect on how your stories carry out of your program, i.e. family and yourself. And I think that is just so defining right there. Thank you so much, Baron. Wonderful. Um, you know, I will tell you that on VMR, we almost never go without talking about food at some way, shape, or form. And I, all of you have mentioned your and global connections. I'm curious what, now that you've been like, Yeah, I, think I, think we, we the question. I think we lost. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I'm I guess, so oh, he's in person. Um, I'm so sorry, folks. I just reset the internet, so we should be good for the, uh, for the rest of the session. Um, I was asking you if you wouldn't mind sharing what your favorite dish is. I, I was alluding to that because I think, um, I think all of you have, have shared with us your global footprint, but what is it that you enjoy eating the most? I think it's going to be a like a mini fight here. <laughs> we will always discuss. So Cesar is from Peru and from Ecuador. Both we have ceviche and we love ceviche. And uh, we always say like, no. And, like Adarsh and I have been hearing ceviche since we started Chief. We have not gotten to taste <laughs> ceviche yet. Yeah. So. But we, we, we all agree that Ecuadorian is ceviche, Ecuadorian ceviche is better. Okay. <laughs> so <Nice>. I'm sorry <laughs> for my, my, my Peruvian friends. <laughs> For, for oh, anybody that has not tried ceviche, please, please try Peruvian ceviche. You are, <laughs> you are not so, gonna. So I think samosa, which is from India, is the best food that you can yes. ever eat. <laughs> I, I like all food. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> all right, uh, Leonidas, why don't you like you win this one? Whatever you decide. I mean, uh, I, I mean, I can see that the bars like uh, all uh, you know all food. So yeah, I, I can say that. <laughs> uh, okay you oh, know what i think comments are saying samosa i think i think we i think we no, no, comments ceviche. 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 wow <laughs> you know i actually i will enter this battle because i grew up in pakistan i spent um i spent 15 years in pakistan my parents worked there at a lebanese i am actually lebanese by uh, i was born in lebanon and lived outside beirut and then um, my parents worked at a lebanese international school in Lahore, Pakistan. And I visited India three times. And I will tell you that unfortunately, ceviche wins. I'm so sorry. Oh. I'm so, so, so sorry. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. You know, because, because, because okay, because, um, uh, I, you know, there's no, there's no, there's no simple because I ate samosas for all my life. But the first time I had Peruvian ceviche, actually, um, Peruvian ceviche, Peruvian ceviche wins. wins. <laughs> But by the way, <laughs> as, the, as the CP Solvers team will tell you, everything that I say is almost certainly not true, as you'll see. When we discuss <laughs> so I think we're back at score one. Amazing. Well, thank you so much for, um, for showing us your humanity and the depth and quality of your program and, and that it's so apparent. I'll tell you by this time when I was the chief, I was a little bit tired and burnt out. So for me, actually the biggest barometer of the success of your program is how many of you are smiling and, and happy sitting there, um, which, is, uh, which is fantastic. 
Um, so I think um, just to set the stage for what we'll do for the rest of the session is we'll actually talk through a case. And I'd highly encourage all of you um, uh, uh, to participate in the chat. I'll be very transparent. I think we struggled with how to um, engage the audience in this, uh, in this space. And we, we talked about engaging just the CP Solvers team members or engaging everybody through allowing them to unmute. But I think this is an uncertain space where a lot of people may be seen as evaluatory or stressful in some way, shape or form. And so for today, I will swallow the whole spotlight and actually carry the conversation myself. But the goal and aspiration is for all of us to become more comfortable with this new format such that nobody feels evaluated or judged. And hopefully a few iterations in, uh, we can have everybody uh, participate. And hopefully if y'all would, uh, would be comfortable coming back um, and doing our final session to commemorate you um, starting where everybody um, can feel comfortable sharing. So that's, uh, we'll do that for a little bit. And then we'll actually have an open house and have everybody ask questions to the chat um, and, um, and moderate the session. That sound good? Perfect. Sounds good. Yeah. Perfect. So maybe before we begin, I will actually pass the mic to the CP Solvers team members to say a quick hello and introduce themselves because the truth is without them, this would not be happening. And I see a few of them here. So I'll start with Kirtan who's closest to me and I'll ask you Kirtan to pass the mic to the next CP Solvers team member. Hello friends, so myself, Kirtan Petrolia, I am from the state of Gujarat and you know we're talking about our favorite food so everyone knows that we have Gujaratis, you know, love sweets so like anything which is sweet and syrupy, we love that and that's why, you know, we have so much diabetes, our hospitals are full of ketoacidosis so we have to control that and yes, I am looking forward to this session, I attended your guys, you know, virtual open house and it was so amazing, we know Dr. Gatwain's enthusiasm, you can see it in her smile, it in his face, you know. So now I would like to pass the mic to maybe Sukriti because I can see her right beside me. So Sukriti, maybe you can introduce yourself. Hi everyone. I love um, every, so Kirtan is, I think he's mentioned this story before um, about Gujarat and sweets. And I, I love listening to his stories from Gujarat, um, but I'm Sukriti and um, I recently moved to the States. I also did my medical school from India, like a lot of people here. And I'm so excited to join in with you guys today. Um, Kiara, do you want to take the mic? Hi friends, I'm Kara. I'm a recent graduate from Peru. And I, as all of you, I love talking about food. And well, I will be applying next year, but for now I'm studying for a step one exam. And I'm so happy to have in this, this session and I'm happy to, to hear this case today. So maybe Daniela can introduce her, herself. Hi everyone, my name is Daniela. I'm a medical student from Brazil, currently studying for the SAP1 exam. Uh, and I'm very happy to be here and have this opportunity, opportunity to hear from this program that seems amazing, just uh, from the people uh, sharing their experiences, where they came from, and all, um, all that happened during residency. And yeah, I think I'll pass the mic to Rafa. Um, I know he's also stud is studying for um, yeah, residency in the US, so yeah. Hi everyone, uh, so my name is Rafael and I'm a medical student here from Brazil. And yeah, I did my step one back in March, quite a journey. <laughs> now I'm studying for a step two and really, really grateful to be here with you guys. It's really amazing to hear all those stories and what you guys went through, just incredible. And now I uh, guess I will pass the mic to AMK. Hey everyone, I'm Anne Marie, um, sometimes referred to as AMK. I'm a hospitalist at UNC in North Carolina and I just love um, getting to be inspired um, by the awesome team here at CP Solvers every day. And I'm so excited about this. Um, I don't, is there anyone else who hasn't introduced themselves? I think um, we're good. Thanks for checking, MK. I, I, uh, I scrolled through the lineup and we have two more people to say, uh, for, um, to say hello. Franco, do you want to say hi? Hi, everybody. Uh, oh, I think we might have lost Franco. Oh. 
or, or it's me. I can't tell. <laughs> uh, I, I, while we wait for Franco to come back, Charmaine, please say hi. So I see my lurking in the background and I work this time. <laughs> hi, everyone. Okay, I'm <laughs> hi, everyone. I'm Charmaine. I'm one of the CBS Law Racing members. Um, I also uh, was born and raised in Iran. And I love that whole oh. community, this amazing thing. <laughs> the, hi, murder, you. the murder of Charmaine Franco is happening live right now. <laughs> oh, Franco is so much more amazing. So, Franco, can you just repeat that, please? Hi, can you hear me? I have, I have, I have been contagious by rowdy internet problems. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, hi everybody. I'm Franco. I am from Peru as well. I am applying for internal medicine this year, and I love uh, how amazing is clinical reasoning to be gathering a lot of people here, and I will love this session a lot. Amazing, Charmaine, jump back in, please. Um, hey everyone, I am Charmaine. I am currently a hospitalist as well. I, this initiative is so near and dear to my heart because I was also born and raised in Iran. I moved here a little earlier for college, but I'm just so grateful to all of these incredible CP Solvers team members to create this sky, to this space, and then it, Jacoby Medical Center, all the chiefs, you seem so amazing. Thank you for being here. And I'm so excited to learn more and um, from all of you. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Thank you. All right, y'all. If you're if you're an audience member and you're hanging back, um, we're about to we're about to go on a roller coaster ride. I know our folks have a fantastic case for us, so why don't we jump ahead? Sure. Okay. Um, do you sure. want to share screen or? Um, so we have a couple of slides. Should we share our screen or? Yeah. Yeah, you know what? Um, I, you know, we typically record everything that okay. you have. So, if, um, please, um, I would just, if you don't mind, just start off with your problem representation, and yeah. Um, yeah. and we'll put it on our screen, and then we can pass the the screen to you guys. Okay, sounds good. Um, all right. So for problem representation, we have um, a thirty five year old gentleman with uncontrolled HIV, admitted with fever, disseminated rash and found to have scattered hepatic lesions and pulmonary tubular nodular lesions. Ooh, wow, straight to the heart of the matter. This is incredible. <laughs> and I think um, just for context for everybody, um, on, on virtual morning report, we usually dissect the case in a much slower way. Um, but actually, because of these shorter sessions, we figured we'd come to the heart of the matter, discuss it, learn about it, and then um, actually ask our friends to share a little, a little bit more information. So I think in clinical reasoning, we, def we try to divide the case into the background and the foreground. And in this case, um, that division is gonna be very helpful because there's a lot of information. So what is the background? It's the data that existed before the patient presumably got unwell. And in this case, it's very clear that the background data is dominated by uncontrolled HIV. And that um, is the center of gravity by which we have to analyze the case for sure. The foreground is so clearly articulated by our very savvy chief residents that is the, the, and the current syndrome that we have to understand is an inflammatory syndrome defined by fever that and that includes involvement of the skin, the lungs, and the liver. So that's how we begin to solve this problem. Now, anytime that there's inflammation going on defined by the fever, the CP solvers really likes to use a mnemonic that was made famous by our other co-founder, Reza Manesh. And he, um, uh, he coins it as the I made mnemonic. I stands for infection, M for malignancy, A for autoimmune disease, D for drugs, and E for endocrinopathy. So that, I guarantee you, no matter what, inflammation is such a dominant part of this case. Again, I, M, A, D, E, infection, malignancy. We will find either one of those things or multiple of those things today for sure. What's really fascinating about HIV is how few autoimmune diseases exist in patients with HIV. Now, you may wonder and say, well, that's not necessarily true. 
there are there is HIV associated autoimmune thrombocytopenia. There's HIV associated autoimmune hemolytic anemia, and even most crazy of all, HIV is associated with the development of TTP thrombotic thrombocytopenic uh, purpura. So HIV plus hematological autoimmunity is certainly well described, but in general, uh, uh, the A bucket of autoimmune within HIV is much less common. Usually, usually in patients with advanced HIV, we put the spotlight on infection. And that's appropriate because HIV is an immunosuppressing condition. But there's two big caveats to that. The first is when we think immunosuppression, we start to think esoteric. We start to think about um, the syndromes we, we wouldn't otherwise think about in immunocompetent patients, such as JC virus, such as Kaposi sarcoma, but we shouldn't do that. The reason we shouldn't do that is because the, the most common infections in patients with HIV are actually the regular infections like strep pneumo and other common infections, immunocompromised hosts, and the only difference is those infections are more common, but also more severe. How are you going to remember that? Take a guess at the rate of bacteremia and strep pneumo pneumonia in an immunocompromised host like HIV, 20%. In an immunocompetent host, less than 1%. So HIV takes strep pneumo and makes it much more common and much more severe. Let me share uh, the other parts of the landscape with you. So you really have to say in a patient who has HIV and has an infection, routine infections are much more common, much higher rate of strep pneumo, much higher rate of disseminated salmonella, much higher rate of Neisseria meningitidis, and much higher rate of granulomatous diseases that wouldn't otherwise cause problems like TB, histo, uh, 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 telacromyces, and West mania. But you have to also recognize that independent of the immune system, all these sexually transmitted infections are fair game. And when you start to analyze the immunocompromising conditions, should you think about all the CD4 independent, uh, CD4 related infections? So to summarize, you've told us this patient has advanced HIV and our instinct is to focus on infections. And our instinct is to focus on these infections here. You gotta check that instinct because this is way more common. Okay. I told you there were two caveats. I've lost track of all the numbers I've given you, but there's another big caveat. And that big caveat is the, pay, the rate of malignancy in HIV is so high. And it's high because the, some viruses actually manifest not as infections in patients with HIV, but actually manifest because of their oncogenic potential. So in this patient, you ha we have to entertain in parallel with the risk of infection, the risk of infection-induced cancer. So these viruses like EPV, HHV, and HPV, all are infections that markedly increase the risk of cancer, either liquid lymphoma or leukemias, or fascinating vascular or plasma cell tumors from HHV8, like Kaposi's sarcoma, or these liquid tumors, and a lot of solid tumors too. This is the autoimmune bucket that I was telling you about, which is very short compared to the infection bucket. So um, I'll, I'll ask Kiara to share the screen and tell you that your problem representation is superb. It, car it carries the key um, background uh, data, which is uncontrolled HIV. When you hear that, your instinct is gonna, gonna go start to think about esoteric infections. Stop. Think about more common, more severe manifestations of common illnesses. And don't forget the HIV risk of malignancy. So here, I think the question is, what can we do with the specific information you've given us? You've given us this, this inflammation has very specific features. It involves the liver and the lungs and the skin. So how, we made a lot of progress, but how can we apply the, we made a lot of progress by applying the HIV filter and the inflammation filter. And then the final filter, which is the most specific filter here is the specific manifestations of inflammation here, rash, liver lesions, and pulmonary lesions. I'll tell you that the most, the best way to try to solve a problem in medicine is to find the schema with the lowest number of possibilities. A rash that is part of a systemic inflammatory syndrome 
is a very powerful filter. If you list the list of things that can happen in the liver and lung as part of a systemic syndrome, very high, very, very high. But when you say that the rash is also part of the systemic syndrome, the rash here is the most powerful filter. Why? It's the most narrow differential diagnosis. So let's focus on the rash. If you tell me that a patient has uncontrolled HIV fever and a rash only, I will remind you that the rate of SJS and TEN in patients with HIV is almost a hundredfold higher than patients without HIV because of the immune dysregulation of HIV, but also because of the medications that patients with HIV can get. Antiretrovirals are a powerful trigger for SJS TN as is Bactrim, which is a medication that they're often on for prophylaxis. But the crazy thing about <clears throat> SJS TN is it doesn't usually cause a, um, a, a visceral syndrome. It just destroys the skin, but nothing else. So here, the drug-induced causes are unlikely because there is visceral involvement, and the visceral involvement would only implicate dress, but that does not show up as lesions. So we can take the D away. We can take the endocrinopathy away because it's, un, it's very rare in a patient with HIV. I told you why autoimmune is less likely, and so we're down to what infections and malignancies can do this. Now, here's the fun fact metastatic cancer to the skin is very rare, very rare. Most skin cancers, unlike the brain, the lung, the liver, is actually primary cancers. So if I tell you your patient has skin cancer, you're probably like, oh, tell me, is it melanoma, basal cell, stem cell, whatnot. So what cancers involve the skin in a diffuse metastatic pattern? I'm going to pull it up and show you. Da, da, da. Okay. God, this is so rich, y'all. Okay. Oops, sorry, it's the wrong schema. Uh, too many schema. Almost there. Here you go. Okay, we are here, my friend. Here we are. So these are the ones we talked about. Melanoma, basal cells, squamous cell, they're pretty common. I think in a patient like this, we have to worry about these. Now, what are they? Have to worry about Kaposi sarcoma. Have to. Have to worry about lymphoma or leukemia cutis. We talked about them being on the EBV-related diseases or the HHV-related diseases. And of course, um, Merkel cell carcinoma, which can be related to HIV. But I think that's the cancer. The infections, oh, there's so many. I'll tell you, infections fall into two buckets here. A granulomatous infection, like mycobacterium tuberculosis, or all the cryptococcus, or all the endemic mycosis. Depending on where the patient is from, if they're from South America, you might have to think about leishmaniasis. And the one vascular infection, and that vascular infection is Bartonella or bacillary angiomatosis. So I'll summarize before passing the mic to you all to take us and teach us, but this problem representation is superb. It made me talk a lot. And uncontrolled HIV plus inflammation. Inflammation, I made. Infection, malignancy, autoimmune drugs, and endocrinopathy. In, a, in the specific syndrome that you're describing here, the skin is the biggest filter Metastatic disease to this metastatic cancer of the skin is very rare and really limits the differential diagnosis to lymphoma and Kaposi sarcoma of the cancers. But the spotlight in patients with HIV with a disseminated rash should be on infection. And the list is very long, but the categories are very small a granulomatous infection or a vascular infection like bacillary angiomatosis. So we'll pass the mic to you all to, um, uh, to take that. Um, uh, uh, overly broad approach and tell us what data you had and what, I know you have some images to share with us. We'll pass them like back to you. Okay, so Ravi, that was amazing. If those themes pop up in my head, the next time I see a patient, I think my life will be so much easier. 
Um, I'm gonna go into the history now. Uh, so we'll just go like we'll just go into some details about all the like uh, all the things in the problem representation that we talked about. So um, so 35 year old gentleman uncontrolled HIV. So he's coming in with three months of a disseminated, elevated, painless rash over his chest, back, and legs. Um, one month of like, so over three months, he's, no, he's had the rash. And then over the course of a month, he noticed a desquamation of the lesions. And then one week of fevers, chills, and that's what brought him to the ER. Um, under his uh, review of systems, the most pertinent thing was significant weight loss, but other than that, nothing else. Um, should, should I go into past medical history? Okay, so past medical history, uh, his HIV was diagnosed five years ago, sexually acquired. He is not taking meds for the last two years, and he has a prior uh, reported history of syphilis, which was treated. He is not on any medication, and uh, for social history, he is originally from Mexico, daily drinker and smoker, no drug use, no recent travel, sex, or sick contact. Anything else? No, uh, no allergies. This is beautiful. I'll, I'll just share some um, some pieces of information here um, that that are interesting. I think um, you should always be careful about the time course of things because the rash is much more visible to the patient than their liver or lung lesions. So we don't know if they aren't occurring simultaneously, right? Um, but I think the time course is very very helpful. Um, it's not surprising that there's weight loss in the face of the systemic syndrome. And I think you just, what weight loss does is it gives you a barometer of how severe the problem is rather than give you any localizing features. I think um, you're seeing the, the, uh, um, the other risk of HIV, which is the risk of concomitant sexually transmitted infections here with syphilis. And one fun fact about syphilis is it spares, it, it can cause disease in any organ except two. And the two organs that syphilis tends to spare are the lungs and the hematological system. So luetic, luetic, which is syphilis, skin involvement, brain involvement, everything, but you will not say luetic pneumonitis ever, or very rarely, and you probably will not say th these hematological issues are from syphilis, with the exception of the rare entity of paroxysmal cold hemoglobinuria, which you should only say if you're getting really fancy on a CP solvers BMR. Um, I think the travel to Mexico is really important and really intriguing. And I imagine we have some friends from Mexico on this call. And I will tell you that you have to be, um, you have to um, know that your bias is gonna be to prioritize tuberculosis, but there are other important infections to think about in patients who travel from this region. And there's two important ones to keep in the back of your mind. The other is brucella, the rate of unpasteurized milk and disseminated brucella, which can cause liver, lung, and skin lesions is actually measurably high and Mycobacterium tuberculosis close cousin, which is Mycobacterium bovis. M. bovis, the highest rates of M. bovis outside of BCG vaccination are from Mexico. And again, that's because of unpasteurized milk. So when you hear Mexico in the United States, you worry about tuberculosis, but remember to worry about the two Bs as the cousins of tuberculosis, brucella and bovis, which again would account for the syndrome. But I think here you're really looking for more and more data to help you clarify the syndrome and we'll pass the mic to you all um, to give us that data. Okay. Um, for the physical exam, we wanted to show you guys the rash. I think that that's gonna be a good idea. Yeah, so I'll just start telling you the vitals and then we'll share our screen for the, for the rash. Um, his blood pressure was 92 over 66. Pulse was 127. Uh, temperature 102 Fahrenheit, respiratory rate was 18, and SAT was 100% on room air. Um, for the rest of his exam, apart from tachycardia, his cardiovascular exam was normal. Respiratory exam, it was clear to auscultation bilaterally. Abdomen was soft, uh, but distended and uh, non-tender. 
uh, he had bowel sounds present. Neuro-wise, he was ANO times three, no focal neurological deficit. And for skin, we'll just uh, share screen. Can everyone see the rash? Wow, this is uh, this is dramatic, y'all. Wow. Um, you know, it's amazing how a picture has a thousand words here. It is. This is an extensive, very aggressive rash that is essentially everywhere, huh? Yeah. Yeah. So it was like a generalized round. Um, erythematous papule and like uh, plaques in the rash everywhere. Yeah. Yeah, and you know, I think um, I would just pause and share a piece of advice for everybody. If you're just listening to the, to me, you're missing out. There's a tremendous amount of wisdom coming in from the chat. So take a few moments um, to look at that, and maybe I'll ask all of us now, since we have a dramatic image, to pause and reflect, put your thoughts together, and put them in the chat. And I'll share mine in a moment. Um, but I think, um, yeah, let's pause and get, get your thoughts in the chat. I'll pause for 30 seconds, okay? Marvelous thoughts, y'all. Keep them coming. And by the way, if you feel uncomfortable with your name popping up in the chat, you can either just delete your name or change your name um, and put your thoughts in there. Y'all, if, um, if uh, you are able to have these smiles on your faces, take care for patients who are this vulnerable. Um, I kind of want to come and hang out with you all, if that's okay. I will miss the warmth of California, but oh. More than wow. welcome. Please come. <laughs> oh, that's very, very, oh, that's incredible. Um, you know, I think that uh, th for me as a non-expert, this rash just really blows my mind and makes me really worried. And I don't think I can make much more progress, but to share the very limited scripts I have because I'm not a dermatologist. I think if we were just to filter down from what we talked about earlier, which is, is this of the cancers, is this Kaposi's sarcoma or lymphoma? Lymphoma, uh, I've never seen it with such extensive involvement of the skin without devastation. You know that I expect the patient to have to be much sicker, even though he's actually very sick right now. So I think that makes it a little bit unusual. The one fascinating thing about Kaposi's sarcoma is the, the pronounced presence of, um, of lymphadenopathy associated with it. And as a consequence, the amount of lymphedema that tends to accompany Kaposi's sarcoma. So here again, a law of proportionality is broken where I expected much more lymphedema. Even though the lesions look vascular in nature, um, the lack of edema made me move away from Kaposi's sarcoma and the lack of uh, mucocutaneous involvement. Um, you know, Kaposi's sarcoma tends to involve the acral surfaces, so the hands and feet, but also tends to involve the mouth. And actually, the NAJM recently pub published a case of conjunctival Kaposi's sarcoma. Um, in terms of the, so the, both the cancers are a little bit less likely for those two reasons. Um, in terms of the infections, I think every single one of them is at play. I think you have to think about disseminated Bartonella here because of the vascular nature of those lesions um, in the form of basilar basilary angiomatosis. Um, but I, I think I worry about something I wasn't worried about before. And the one thing I would do about these lesions is to check whether there is sensation in them. Because another form, another disease that you have to think about in, in Mexico is another cousin of mycobacterium tuberculosis, and that's mycobacterium leprae. And so leprosy is a condition to, um, 
that, uh, that you can easily get more insight into by studying whether there's a neurologic component to the rash, which we often don't do. Like we touch it and, and it might be insensitive. Uh, nerve enlargement. Uh, one fun fact about um, leprosy is in Mexico specifically, there's another form of leprosy called mycobacterium lepromatosis. And that is deserves specific mention here because unlike mycobacterium leprae, it has a much higher rate of dissemination. So most people with leprosy have cutaneous disease alone and a smaller fraction of patients disseminate their disease, but that fraction is higher in patients with mycobacterium lepro lepromatosis, which is common in Mexico. So geez, uh, good luck. Uh, I think that um, you'll probably find an answer very quickly by biopsying this, this, uh, uh, this case. And, um, and I, I would, well, my only caution is just like we talked about, the patient, once a patient has an immunocompromising condition, the number of infections they have, the number of diagnoses they have is limitless. So my only advice is if you find an answer, don't stop, keep looking, keep looking until you find as many possible answers as possible. All right, I'll hand the mic back to you all. Um, all right, so we'll uh, we'll go into we'll go into the labs. So we're we'll going to the ones that are commonly just the the initial set of labs, and then we'll go into the the biopsies. So hold on to that thought about uh, getting the answer. All right, so uh, CBC the white count was five. Um, hemoglobin was seven point two, hematocrit twenty point seven, and platelet count of one hundred. The differential on the white count was a neutrophil uh, count of, like it was 44%, lymphocytes 28%, immature granulocytes 7.5%, and eosinophil zero. Um, BMP, the sodium was 130, uh, potassium 3.5, chloride 96, bicarb 22, BUN 9, creatinine 0.9, and glucose 110, anion gap was 11.9. Um, LFTs, AST was 125, ALT 32, albumin 1.7, globulin 4.8, T billy was 2.9, direct billy was 1.8, um, ALKFOS 85. Coags wise, INR was 2.2. PTT was 32.9, D-dimer was 1,179, and the lactate was 6.4, um, CD4 count 70. Okay. Uh, 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 okay, so then we will uh, we'll go into the biopsy and um, yes, so the skin biopsy was done almost immediately. And um, the biopsy came back as psoriasis, eruptive hyphen guttate. And immunohistochemistry was negative for syphilis and HHV8. So at this point, we're, we were pretty stumped. We'll take a pause here. <laughs> Yeah, you know, I, I think it's, it's absolutely very, it's very surprising that um, one, may I just summarize the labs? It seems like the, the CBC is notable for some mild anemia and mild thrombocytopenia. Yeah. And the renal panel and the liver panel are relatively unremarkable with the CD4 count being very low. Is that, mm -hmm. is that a fair summary? I might have missed. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. And so I think that you're seeing that there's sparing of the hematological system relatively not, I mean, you expect a patient with, who is this sick to have a little bit of anemia and thrombocytopenia, but the liver being normal and um, the lungs being normal, the liver and the kidney being normal is humbling, especially knowing that this patient has now li many liver lesions and lung lesions, which we'll right. find out uh, really, really is humbling just to take a pause in that, in that sense. Um, I think that um, the, the finding of psoriasis is to some extent um, surprising, but if you reformulate that problem and remove the HIV context, you mm -hmm. might not be so surprised. And the reason that is, is the most common, if you might label this as erythroderma, you know, an extensive rash that involves um, the body in more than, um, uh, in more than 90% of the surface area. Psoriasis accounts for 50% of those patients, if you label it that way. And I think it's very easy to, um, uh, to be worried about HIV specific manifestations. I don't know, and I am sure there might be an association between HIV and psoriasis, 
but I think the um, the Sarai form rash is is very informative here. Um, so what um, I think the question is, what would I do next? And I think in real life, you probably want to, you know, the skin is involved and the question is what else is involved? How can you, uh, how can you, um, how can you make progress with the, um, the seriatiform uh, manifestations of this syndrome? And I'm not sure that I can. I know that gut ate psoriasis has an association with streptococcal infections, and that can be a trigger of it. Um, but I would view the psoriaform rash as, hey, it didn't take me to where I want to go. And so let me see if, if this patient who is critically ill has any visceral involvement that might afford a more specific clue. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, okay, so at this point, yes. So we uh, our approach was very similar to look for what else was involved. And then also a very extensive um, infectious workup was also pursued. So we're going we're gonna to share our screen again for the infectious workup as well as the imaging. You want to read? Uh, may I ask a question? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I believe that platelets were 100, INR 2.2, um, albumin was very low. How was the bilirubin? 1.8. Um, Direct bili was 1.8. 1.8, okay. Okay, thank you. So, in terms of the infectious workup, um, a ferritin was checked, which was surprisingly high at uh, 3,000. Uh, the triglyceride was normal, and the uh, interleukin 2 receptor was actually high. And then, as you can see, the rest of the infectious workup, including blood culture, AFB blood culture, syphilis, crypto, endemic fungi, a fungi COVID antibodies, Bartonella antibodies, and quantifero were negative. And then a uh, CAT scan was pursued because it, uh, the source of the infection was not really identified. Um, and the CAT scan of the chest, uh, as reported by the radiologist, showed these tubular nodular densities bilaterally, but mainly in the left upper lobe, uh, which could be related to pulmonary um, arteriovenous malformations. And the CAT scan of the abdomen shows these uh, hypodense lesions in the uh, right lobe of the liver and also the right dome of the liver with some perihepatic ascites. Because of this, an MRI was also pursued, which also identified scattered hepatic lesions throughout multiple segments of the liver and ascites and generalized mesenteric edema. And with that piece of involvement of the rest of the organs, I think that we can stop here before giving the final diagnosis. Yo, look at this. Can I tell you something? If you're thinking about this program, you have to step back and be like, how, how well do they know their patients and how are they thinking about their cases? And y'all are just marvelous, really. I think the way that you put the story together um, is no different than how we evaluate a medical student presenting. Um, and, but this is of a higher order. How do you tell a very complicated story? And you're telling it so incredibly well. Thank you for bringing it here, really. Um, I'll pause. Um, I'll pause for a moment to let folks in the chat collect their thoughts, and then I'll share mine, and uh, we'll get to the case conclusion. All right, y'all. So this is a very intriguing case. And I think that at the end of the day, you have to be a little bit careful with the infectious disease testing. Um, the reason that is, is none of the tests that we got are definitive. Um, histopathology is the gold standard for every granulomatous infection, TB, histo, et cetera. And so you have to operate with that um, limitation in the back of your mind. Um, so um, with that caveat in mind, um, you can ask yourself, what do I know about this patient? And I think you can be very confident that this patient has an HLH-like phenotype. Um, what is HLH? HLH stands for acidic lymph histiocytosis, and it means nothing. What it can mean is that it's a way of inflammation. It is no different than lymphocytosis or 
eosinophilia, it is just gives you a, a clue that this inflammation has a unique pattern to it. Why is it helpful to know that pattern? Because it restructures the eye-made mnemonic. In eye-made, we always start with the eye because infection is the most common. But as soon as a patient has HLH, all of a sudden, cancer becomes the most likely. In the United States, HLH, the pattern of inflammation, is owing to malignancy in about 50% of cases. Okay? And what cancer is? It's usually lymphoma or Castleman's disease. Here, the HHV serology being negative makes Castleman's less likely, although one third of patients with Castleman's are HHV negative. So lymphoma has to be a very, very prominent consideration here, and one that can only be ruled out if you find an infection and you treat the infection and the patient gets better because the patient could have both an infection and a lymphoma, okay? All the granulomatous infections are fair game, primarily because histopathology, as we said, is the gold standard. But you might make some progress by studying the clues of this syndrome here. And the clues are the pulmonary involvement seems to be vascular in origin. The um, skin involvement appeared to be vascular, although biopsy moved away from that. And the hepatic involvement may be vascular involvement as inferred by the uh, uh, fluid around the liver. So here, I think I would be worried about lymphoma. I would not, uh, lymphoma, I would be worried about lymphoma. I wouldn't rule out HHV8 negative Castleman's disease. I would remain humble to the possibility of a granulomatous infection that needs histopathology, but I think one unique infection in this patient population deserves special consideration, which you otherwise won't think about, and that is disseminated Bartonella. Disseminated Bartonella can cause pileosis hepatis, which has a characteristic radiological pattern that you might talk to radiology about, and causes vascular disease. AVMs is certainly possible as a skin involvement. So, if we go back to our original hypothesis, we said, hey, this, is, this may be a liquid cancer, maybe a granulomatous infection, and maybe a vascular infection of the skin. And I think we're still there. And because we haven't found a cancer, because we haven't found a granulomatous infection, and we haven't looked for Bartonella, I would look for that specifically. But in a patient with HIV, I encourage you to use the word and a lot. Bartonella and lymphoma. Castleman's and TB. So not or, and. And, and um, I'll pass the mic to you all to share what you learned from the case and uh, what the answer turned out to be. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, I think, I think what you said is really true. And I think once, you know, once we got the skin biopsy and it turned out to be not... Um, as helpful with finding a unifying diagnosis. Everything that we talked about in the beginning when we did the problem representation, all of that becomes fair differentials again. So with that said, um, we will share the screen again. So the patient was started on broad spectrum antibiotics for 14 days. Repeat MRI did not show any improvement of the hepatic lesions and the patient was started on antiretrovirals. So we have another uh, physical exam finding uh, to share one second. Um, okay. So repeat physical exam showed this lesion, which was then biopsied and turned out to be Kaposi sarcoma, HHV8 positive staining of neoplastic cells. Um, so then after discussion with hematology and infectious diseases, since the patient had already started, wait, let me stop sharing. Okay. Yeah, since the patient had already improved after starting antiretrovirals, chemotherapy was deferred and repeat labs from the clinic after discharge showed resolution of coagul coagulopathy, resolution of the abnormal LFTs, CT, chest and abdomen showed resolution of the liver lesions, ascites and pulmonary. And that's that. Oh my gosh. Wow. Woo, mind blown. Kudos to you for the repeat physical exam. Those are the most humbling and educational cases. Wow. Do you want to share what your reflections were from either uh, hearing about this case or putting it together? What did you learn? Yeah, actually, I, I took care of this patient when he was on the ward as a resident. 
And um, I remember doing the physical exam of the oral mucosa at the beginning and not finding any lesion. And then repeating then after we didn't find any solution of the 14 days of antibiotics and no resolution of any of the uh, lesions in the liver concerning for abscesses. And then finding this lesion and pursuing a biopsy to try to match everything together with a diagnosis of KS. Probably there is reports of KS really evolving or, or showing when the patient is a sterile antiretroviral, but probably the psoriasis lesions was really confusing the picture. And it's really important to remember this dichotomy between uh, racers and uh, deacons, uh, especially in patients with HIV, yeah. because they very frequently present more than one pathology. And in this case, it was psoriasis plus disseminated KS that fortunately respond to antiretrovirals um, with a lot of inflammatory response, though. No, oh, I am. Um, I have to. Yeah. Sorry. sorry. <laughs> no, go ahead, please. Please go ahead. No, just what you said, like even before we got the answer, um, and with HIV and not or is actually so key for this patient that it was psoriasis and something else, or and this happens a lot with this patient population. It's not always to, possible to find the one unifying diagnosis. Yeah, I think that's um, that is such a wise thing to continue to emphasize for sure. Um, I think, I don't know, I have, I have so much reflecting to do about this case, but I, I really, I think the purposes of you all bringing this case is to um, illustrate how you um, present cases, how you think about your patients and how, what your patients may present with. And I think um, it's been a treat to have an hour um, to, for you to share the stage and show us who you are. And um, maybe we can take a little bit of time to, um, to see if the chat has any questions. So um, unless you have any um, words to reflect on the case again, I'll just open it up to the chat to see what questions you all, uh, CP solvers, team members, anybody, drop in your questions in the chat and I will, uh, I will moderate a, a, a thank you to our friends from Jacoby Medical Center and um, any questions you have. <laughs> Henry, do you want to unmute and ask your uh, um, ask your question? Yeah, I was trying to remember the pictures from earlier. I guess I was curious if it was thought that any of the skin lesions were due to um, carposis, or if all of them were thought to be due to psoriasis, and kind of maybe if one of the lesions biopsied was psoriasis, and some of the others were due to KS. Actually, um, most of the lesions in the skin were, uh, were thought to be psoriasis, and dermatology at that point started the patient on uh, treatment. And because this patient stayed in the hospital for at least three weeks, he, at the end of his admission, had the resolution of almost all the skin lesions. Uh, that's why we start chasing for the KS inside the mouth. Awesome. Thanks so much. Mm, marvelous. And I see a couple of other people. Um, uh, Kim, do you want to unmute and ask your question? In case uh, um, they're having difficulty unmuting, I'll just ask him. There, oh, everyone, a couple of people are wondering how the patient is doing in follow up. Oh, yeah. so actually, the repeat the repeat CAT scan and MRI show resolution. The patient went compliant to uh, antiretrovirus and is following in the clinic. And no other prosthetic infection was found on the screen for this patient. Amazing. Thank you. I also wanted to open up to folks to see if they have any questions about the program. We, we, we had, we're lucky enough to have five people representing a remarkable program. So please feel free to continue to ask questions about, um, about the case or about the program. And I'll, I'll, I'll mute myself for 30 seconds to collect your question. And folks, may, uh, maybe while, while uh, folks either think about it or, or uh, we'll pass on. Ooh, um, 
I think we have a um, uh, we have a couple of questions in the chat. Um, I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name. Yudnam, do you want to unmute and ask your question? Yes, yes, of course. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you all for sharing this um, amazing case and information about Jacoby. Um, can you tell me a little bit more about the patient population you see at Jacoby? Thank you. Absolutely. I'm really glad that you asked that question uh, because being based in New York allows us to really see people from all over the world. Um, I can tell you my my area of interest is infectious diseases, and I see more cases of neurocystis cirrhosis here in the US than in my back country of Peru. The same with Chagas cardiomyopathy. Uh, you see a variety of patients really coming from all, all over the place. We serve a large African American African community. Sorry, uh, we take care of um, many patients that really don't have insurance, and Jacobi serves as a safety net hospital for those patients. Unfortunately, we're able to provide them with care and we can follow them in our clinic. Um, yeah. Yeah, being myself is heavily interested in infectious disease and yeah, Jacobi is my dream program. So thank you for sharing information. Absolutely. Thank you for sharing your dream. That's awesome. Hinda, where are you calling from? South Korea. Oh, wonderful. Where in South Korea? Yeah. Um, in Seoul. Oh, amazing. Thank yeah. you so much for joining us. Let me guess, it's probably like 2 or 3 a.m. right now? Exactly, 2. Wow. Wow. Look at that. Look at oh that commitment, y'all. Look at that commitment. <laughs> <laughs> Great job. <laughs> I see there's so many questions throwing in, so I'm just going to um, um, just alternate through them. So uh, Amr, who is a, um, a VMR guru, has a question for y'all. Do you want to unmute yourself, Amr? Hello, how's everyone doing? Uh, I was just, uh, you know, as a graduate, I'm sure lots of uh, you here are also applying to different programs next year. I was wondering if you have any any advice for us, especially if uh, any of you were IMGs uh, who applied and uh, managed to get into this amazing program. Do you have any anything you could uh, tell us that we should uh, maybe start working on early on to apply? Thank you in advance. Okay. Uh, yeah, you want to. I, I think that the, the the most important thing um, or recommendation that I will give to any person graduating as a ING is that continue always working really hard. Uh, I think that the most important thing that every program really really watches. I think that as an as an ING myself, sometimes I felt this kind of imposter syndrome, like I don't really belong here or I'm not at the level of the other person. But if you really sit and think about the amazing things that I'm sure you already achieved, you will see that how good are you as a clinician and how good are you and how, uh, how grateful this population gonna feel of being uh, served by a person like you. So I think that the main important thing that I will tell to IMG is always think of yourself and always remember that really good things that you did because every program here in America is gonna be proud to have you as a resident there. I just and I really want to highlight how that was like example here in this in this uh, case that we did that when we talked about differentials early on and um, we got some really amazing differentials in the chat and so many people even said Kaposi sarcoma so you know everyone who's here has spent like this is really directed at the IMGs who are listening. Everyone who's here has worked really hard to be where you are right now and really hard to get um, where, like to, to plan what you're planning right now and really trust yourself, trust your clinical judgment. If things don't like in general, like with patients or um, in general, if things don't really, you know, if you're stumped or if you're confused at some point, likely you have the answer and this was really evidenced in this case that we did so just trust yourself when you um when you interview at program see if the program is a good fit for you i know that's not typically what imgs do you're just so happy to be here you're just so happy to have that interview that it's like it's probably the first time in your life someone has asked you, what do you want? Like really, really think about it because any program, us included, very lucky to have you even considering us. So just see if this is something that you want, see if it's the patient population that you want to serve because really any place would be lucky to have you. 
I, you know, I, I can't tell you how empowering that message is. And I will say, I would just reinforce it. I'm, I'm perfectly involved in program lead. Like I'm not directly involved in the program here, though. I think that um, with, with the education work that we all do, I think we all know what the program has. And, and I, I would, I would say that even the, even the way that we get to know each other here on VMR through talking cases, it's clear to me that everyone here is remarkable. And so thank you for, for emphasizing that. My job right now to facilitate these questions is literally impossible. So I ask that you forgive me if I skip, if I miss your question or skip over it. What I'm prioritizing is to make sure that we have representation. So if I'm, I'm, I'm trying to guess where people are calling from and have gender balance, and that's all I'm trying to do. So in that mind, Sarah, my dear friend, I've, I haven't seen you on VMR in a while. Do you want to ask your question? Uh. I'm so I'm so happy to be here again. I also really love to just listen to everybody here. I just learn so much every time that I come here. And since I'm studying for USMLE Step One, it's difficult to balance like going to college and studying other stuff in college and studying for Step One and just I'm I get very worried about if I'm going to be able to have a U.S. clinical experience and even if I get there, I hope so, but I worry if I'm gonna be able to, um, how can I say that to, how much it differs from being a doctor here in Brazil to being a doctor in the United States. So I wonder like how they manage to overcome that. Um, okay, so I think, yeah, you wanna to check? Yeah. Oh yes, so let me. Oh, Peter, you want to say something? Yeah, I, 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 I can try to answer. Um, I, I come from Greece, as I said at the beginning, and um, I have worked with many, with dozens, maybe hundreds at this point, international medical graduates like you guys and me. Uh, and I can say that uh, typically, not always, not always, but typically international medical graduates like me uh, have had some problems at the beginning which are expected. Um, so the diff, the systems in general, although I don't know the system in Brazil, so I cannot talk about the system in Brazil, but from whatever experience I have uh, from all those people that I have spoken with all those years, I can say that uh, most of the systems around the world, educational systems and health systems have differences as compared to the one in the United States. Uh, so I would say that at the beginning, uh, there is a period of time that um, uh, we need some um, adjustment, uh, which may take a few weeks for some people or a few months or even more for other people. And that's expected. And that's something that the programs that care about uh, international medical graduates know how to handle with. Uh, I needed several weeks or even months to get adjusted to the system. And that was not a problem because I had a lot of support. So there are differences. Um, there are differences, but um, international medical graduates typically uh, have the hard work and the persistence and the willingness to, to, to succeed. Uh, and with some support, those differences um, are getting, um, uh, we're getting by with those differences. So um, I'm, not really, uh, I'm not really concerned, to be honest with you. Typically, I'm not concerned about any IMD that um, starts their um, um, uh, graduate medical training in the United States. Another empowering answer. Thank you so much for sharing that. And, and also your personal touch to it, you know, dozens of hundreds of people of experience is almost proof of what you're saying. Thank you. Um, um, Rishpa, do you want to unmute yourself and ask um, an important but hard question? Thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. Uh, I'm from India as well. And again, a lot of seniors from my hospital have uh, worked in and have passed out from Yekobi. So it uh, just like uh, one of my colleagues from South Korea, it is my dream residency as well. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I've heard all good things about this place. Uh, but if you had the opportunity to change or improve on one thing in your program, what would that be? I think um, saying that uh, any program is perfect is incorrect. 
We all programs uh, are in a growth phase. So currently I'm interviewing for fellowship and if any place says that they're perfect then I don't consider them very highly uh, <laughs> because a, every, every program um, it should be on a growth curve and it should be on an improving trend. So, uh, so I think that there are issues in our program also like any other program. And the most important thing is that our program leadership um, is very receptive to feedback and we improve and continuously follow up on some of the some of the suggestions that are taken uh, that are brought up by the residents so the, so one of the prime examples of this would be um, that we have a monthly resident house staff meeting and we have an open door policy both as the chief residents and um, Dr. Gutwan and the other program leaders so during these monthly house staff meetings um, our uh, our program director, Dr. Goodwin, writes down all the lists of improvements or all the suggestions that the residents bring in to that meeting and then follows up, even though the residents forgot that they brought it up in the previous meeting, he brings it up and says, have these been solved? Um, and it, it, it is, if things are not solved, then they get solved. So, um, so one of, I would say, one of maybe the good things and the bad things uh, about our program is that we are um, a safety net hospital. That means we take care of patients uh, with limited resources. So you get good training in taking care of patients with limited resources, but sometimes um, things may not get done as soon as possible to help the patient. Yeah. Uh, and this is a continuous work. And we bring in, talk to the program leadership and they have been very receptive uh, and uh, I think that we are moving in the right direction in that space. With respect to education, um, our, uh, our program, like all other programs uh, in the United States were affected by the COVID pandemic because they switched to the virtual format. Uh, we, we saw this both as an opportunity and as a drawback, as an opportunity because pe people on other rotations not physically present here could participate, uh, but this does create a disconnect. It's like if all, a uh, hundred people uh, who are participating on the Zoom call were physically here in the room. This would have been so much better. Uh, so, so that's the so. So we are constantly trying to improve all aspects of our program, and I can say that with uh, absolute confidence. Thank you so much Thank for your response. For that, Thank you. Um, spectacular answer. I, th I think for the sake of time, we. Um, we, uh, I want to uh, share the, the stage with a dear friend of the, the VMR community and another international medical graduate. Ramla, I know you had something to say. Do you want to um, unmute yourself and share with us? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Um, so I'm Ramla Kasozi, just a bit about me. Um, so yes, uh, I was an IMG, uh, born in Uganda, but I grew up in Canada. I went to med school in Uganda. I was fortunate to, I just completed my family medicine residency program. Um, so I'm now boardified in family medicine. I attended the University of Minnesota Family Medicine Residency Program. So it is possible for IMGs to do university-based programs. Um, I was very surprised I even got into that program, um, which is amazing. But not to, you know, uh, take the light away from Jacoby because you guys sound very awesome. Thank you once again for the case. Um, I guess I just wanted to share insight that what I learned as an IMG trying to enter into the system is that I think a lot of us forget um, the social dynamics in the history of this country. And like the, I forgot his name from Greece. He was mentioning that you have to really understand, I feel like the history of this country and the people and why the health system, it is what it is. Um, you will find most programs these days. Yes, you may have like a 260, 270 on your step score, but if your understanding of your demographic that you're treating and those social nuances, like understanding, you know, slavery, understanding what has happened to the indigenous people here, what are their dynamics? You know, why are certain groups of people not able to get health? Um, or healthcare in general, um, health systems. And that's why even for me, you know, I came from Canada. I also came from Uganda, totally different health systems. So I had to like really sit down and say, what is Medicare? What is Medicaid? How did this come about? Why do certain people have access? Why do they not? What happens when they enter the hospital? So as you're prepping for the match or even prepping to get into the system, I really encourage you understand the history, but also understand the history from 
you know, uh, hopefully this doesn't come out the wrong way, but I think speak to African Americans, speak to indigenous people, speak to minorities, understand their stories and their experiences with the health system from their lens, not necessarily from white people also, because you will find there's two different sides of the stories. And so that was a very humbling experience that I've received. And so now that I've completed my journey and you know, I'm even now faculty, which I'm just even shocked about coming from the IMG world. Um, <laughs> yeah. So I'm now involved in residence teaching. Um, you know, that's part of sort of my motivation is to, you know, help IMGs understand that just because you have a 270 doesn't mean you're going to get into a program. You know, you have to be ready to understand what do you understand about this Black person that's entering into your system and why do you feel like they could access healthcare? So that's my little bit of advice. Understand American history, but understand it from the lens of the people of color. Thank you. Um, Rama, your words are very powerful, and I uh, will reflect on a very Im important sentence that somebody near and dear in my heart said, which is that you not only have to understand the disease, but you have to understand the person who bears the burden of it. We talked today about Kaposi's sarcoma, but we don't know, because of the nature of this conference, the burden that the person who carries it. And in the United States, the lar the biggest burden that people carry comes along racial lines and of course powerfully gender lines too um and i know that people all across the world are exposed to that gender line but people all across the world are not exposed to that race line and i think that's really really important for you to come in and understand that context and i think that um is a, a place to start that i am biased with um, a place to start to give you where do you begin if you're if you're like okay wow I understand this is important but how do I actually do this a place to start is to start with the with a free uh, clinical problem solvers anti-racism series if you just google clinical problem solvers anti-racism series you will um, find great places to start I would also encourage any one of you who are not on twitter you should be on twitter to follow the threads that people ed uh, educate us on and one person to follow for sure is Ramla. So Ramla, I think to follow up on your on your wisdom, I would really encourage you to put your Twitter handle in the chat for people um, to be able to learn from you and then to learn from the resources that you share. Um, but but as you said, I think that this is an important um, an important message. Uh, it has to occur in parallel with the other important um, another important message, which is. I want to share with you all who, who here, all um, 65 of you who, who have left, the significance of what it means for Jacoby to be here. Um, you know, uh, we were inspired um, by Drs. Alice and Ravi um, in a session that Rafa led um, uh, last week. And within hours, they expressed their interest um, to Franco, our, my, my dear friend, and then reached out to me. And then you saw five of their program. Uh, show up here, present a marvelous case, take an hour and a half of their time on a Saturday, I'll point out. So um, I really want to send a heartfelt thank, thank you to all five of you um, for showing up here, for really, a show, really showing us a little bit of in, into who you are as individuals and, and into the program that, um, that you uh, represent. And I, I'll never forget that you kicked us off with this really important work that we're hoping to do. Um, thank you. Thank you very, very much from the bottom of our hearts. Um, and, and in parallel, this would not be possible without the work of the CP Solvers team members led by Rafa, Sukriti, Kiara, many of whom are here, Danny, and many, many others. So thank you all, and um, we hope you have a wonderful day. Thank, yes, you. thank you so thank much. You very much. Thank you. We enjoyed. Thank you. Thank you.